Okay, are you ready? I'm actually nervous because it's my first Zoom webinar with my own license. So I, mm -hmm. you know, I used to have my tech person supporting me, but this is my first time fly solo. So everyone ready? Yes. Okay, all right, thank you so much. Okay, so good morning, afternoon, evening. Hola, hello. Bonjour, ni hao, konnichiwa, annyeonghaseyo, and hello all. And welcome and thank you for joining us the 21st seminar and RPI day two. Last week, we had horrible Zoom bombs by childish losers. We identified the, their names, fake or real, if you are watching this video or try to join us, I would say grow up and find jobs to help your community rather than wasting your life. I will not waste my time pressing any charge to you because I do not know how long my miraculous second life will last. Life is too short to waste and God finds your ex unacceptable and disgusting. It all began with my university stopping their support and the Zoom bomb happened at the second seminar after switching from webinar to normal Zoom. And when I asked them the license price for a webinar last summer, it was close to 10,000 US dollar per year for 3,000 people. Of course, yes, I'm talking about 3,000 because I was naive and ambitious based on people's excitement and survey regarding attendance. But now, you know, people you know, watching this on through YouTube video, recorded one rather than uh, live, you know, attendance. And I should have looked at the price for a smaller number of audience, but I did not. So I relied on the university license until you know, January this year. And last month, I mean, I got an email regarding this continuation of their support, although it does not cost them any money except for the time of my superhero, tech person, Tony the Iron Man, and after being sick and tired of the such nonsense and Zoom bomb, I decided to buy one cheaper one using my own fund and my Gmail account instead of my uh, school account. So the price was not that bad with the less than $1,000 per year for up to 500 people. So I can, you know, basically you know, entertain up to 500 lively and, and then after that, you know, YouTube videos. So I will not get any real time support from my superhero, but I spent more than four hours to figure out this Zoom webinar features with Tony, the tech man, and also my wife. So I should be fine. Also thank Tony again and also my wife for helping me for the rehearsal about this, you know, seminar series. Okay. It is my tremendous honor to introduce very briefly our pioneer speaker, Professor John Doddy. Uh, of course, Professor John Doddy is the director of RPI Mountain Sinai Joint Center for Engineering and Precision Medicine, and also a member of NAE, National Academy of Engineering. Last week, we hosted Dr. Mateus Kofas from also RPI. So I call today RPI day two. So Professor Dodi, the virtual podium is all yours now. And thank you so much for your time today. Thanks very much, Taesuk. And uh, I think it's wonderful what you're doing here, uh, both to uh, support some of the younger faculty uh, uh, in our field, as well as, of course, uh, help build 
a community. And I think that that's a very important thing that we need to do even more of. Um, so I will share just a few uh, quick slides because I feel that uh, this is really for Lucas to uh, uh, present more than, uh, more than me. I thought what I would do is just give a very, very brief overview, just a few slides uh, on what it is we do uh, in my group, or at least some of the things that we're doing now, uh, as opposed to what we were doing a while ago, just to give a sense of some things that do, I think, relate nicely into some of the things that Lucas will be presenting. So we have been driven for quite some time on maybe the most fundamental of the problems that we have to deal with, which is how do we enhance human health? Uh, and one of the best ways to look at this is how long do people live and ideally how well they live uh, without disease? Uh, and, and the problem with society is how costly it might be. And this is just a, a graph of the health spending per capita uh, among a wide range of different countries uh, and the life expectancy of the people in that country. Uh, you can see immediately that the US is an outlier. Uh, we spend dramatically more uh, per capita, and this is prior to the pandemic, uh, dramatically more than essentially every country in the world. Uh, and yet our uh, life expectancy doesn't rival that of many of the developed world countries. Uh, I had given this talk in Portugal many years ago, and that's why I circled PRT, which is Portugal. But, but you can see that obviously we are really way out of what we should be. And, and, and how do you deal with something like that? And particularly, where can biomolecular science and engineering more broadly help solve that issue? How do we both increase life expectancy and reduce the cost moving uh, to the upper left more than to the right? So what we have done in, in my group <clears throat> is address a number of different areas and, and just to try to address some of the issues that, that I had just raised. One of them is more biomanufacturing uh, and our work initially started mainly with enzyme technology, but it's, it's shifted quite a bit to more cell culture engineering, whether that be in developing various uh, lentiviral vectors that can be important for CAR T therapy, uh, immunotherapy and things like that to manufacturing stem cell system stem cells and their environment uh, so that we can uh, again use that perhaps in expanding generating stem cells uh, differentiating them to specific uh, lineages and to specific cell types that are going to be relevant in regenerative medicine and while it is a biocatalytic approach it does involve cell culture as well is developing a heparin uh, that is not from animals, and that is actually making its way through the FDA right now. So our goal is to generate a bioengineered or biosynthetic heparin that would be uh, as, just as, uh, in fact, identical to what you get from the porcine intestinal heparin uh, in terms of the chemistry, in terms of the biology, in terms of the therapeutic effectiveness. And so that's something that, that we've been working on. We have focused on biocatalysis, not so much in synthetic chemistry, but more in how do we, can we attack infectious disease and the infrastructure with infectious disease. We focus quite a bit on these cell lytic enzymes, which are enzymes that have very highly specific ways to target uh, non-redundant features in cells, particularly some of the cell wall material, and that it can be used to both identify very selectively specific bacteria and species, uh, but can also be used to uh, lyse these bacteria. So we've used both uh, the lytic function of these enzymes as well as the cell wall binding function. And we can incorporate a wide range of both biological and non-biological components to these cell binding, cell wall binding domains. We can incorporate them into coatings, into materials, paints, and so forth. Uh, that can then be used uh, both to identify pathogens, but also eliminate them. And we've been working quite a bit most recently, as many people have, addressing issues with uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, and in particular looking at various molecules that could both enhance the delivery of the vaccine, but also looking at uh, enhancing uh, various uh, natural compounds uh, that could be used to actually intercept the virus before it binds to the cell. Um, 
we have in relation to that have been focusing quite a bit on biomolecular engineering that could be applied to clinical applications. A number of years ago, we developed uh, an approach that we can use magnetic fields that can be used to control gene expression, and that could be used as a remote way to control uh, the up or down regulation of various genes that is relevant both in bio uh, processing, perhaps, but more critically in the ability to address various disease states like pain, Parkinson's, and so forth and so forth. We've been more recently quite interested in broadly neuroinflammation, which if it's a subset of inflammatory responses in the body, which uh, is both relevant from an infectious disease perspective, because that in fact is what drives most of the morbid morbidity and mortality in viral infections, including uh, SARS-CoV-2, but also within the brain, many of the neurodegenerative diseases really take effect as a result of neuroinflammation. And our work has been involved in understanding better one of the key enzymes in that process, which is NADPH oxidase. It is the key enzyme in the, the NOx2 uh, isoform is a key enzyme in microglia in the brain. Uh, it's a key enzyme in macrophages and, and neutrophils and so forth in, systemically that is activated under various conditions leading to an inflammatory response. So ways that we can control that is particularly relevant. Uh, and one of the things that actually activates the NADPH oxidase uh, appears to be circadian disruption. So it, for those of you who stay up too late, don't get enough sleep, it's well known that in fact, the predominance of neurodegenerative diseases goes up when you don't get enough sleep, which unfortunately is to many of us these days. Uh, and we're looking at different ways that we can understand both the mechanism by which circadian disruption causes that, but at the same time, look at various approaches that might allow us to find ways to mitigate against some of those uh, dangerous outcomes, which of course are chronic outcomes that could take many years to develop. And finally, we've been interested for years in experimentally looking at how we can understand whether or not a molecule might be toxic and, and, and do high throughput screening to enable us to uh, identify toxic compounds before they make their way to the clinic because toxicology or toxicity of drug candidates, for example, is one of the primary, if not the primary uh, uh, ways in which compounds fail. Therefore, it has the biggest effect on the cost of drug discovery. Um, but now we're combining the experimental approaches with various machine learning approaches to get an understanding of where uh, we can pull data out of in vitro cell systems, in vivo, animal models, as well as clinical studies with humans, and be able to then predict again early on whether various compounds are likely to be toxic or uh, potentially could be metabolized in a specific way that might lead to a toxic outcome. So let me just conclude by uh, saying this again, Taselik, this is a wonderful opportunity for, uh, for people to see this community, uh, some of the research that's being done, certainly some of the uh, very exciting research done by our younger colleagues. Uh, and um, I'll just kind of leave it at that and hand this off to Lucas and uh, uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, wow, amazing talk and inspiring insight. And your vision and scope of research are as huge as your computer monitor size. I visited, you know, you of course the RPI for a seminar last year. And one thing I want to have was your gigantic computer monitor. And being it doesn't matter what's on the monitor. It, ma it doesn't matter about the monitor. It matters what, what you're doing with the monitor, right? Of course, of course. But still, you know, <laughs> that is a minimum four times bigger than my monitor. And also, of course, it looks like Koreans live longer than Americans. So that's good to me. However, I probably need to sleep more so from now on. So thank you so much. This is amazing. Uh, OK. So now the main speaker of today with a longer introduction. So Lucas is an assistant professor in bioengineering at UPenn. His lab works to understand how cell signals coordinate cell function, particularly in stem cell differentiation. So that kind of some connection with John. 
and also in cancer cells and their response to therapy. Towards these aims, you know, the lab also has expertise in developing like activatable optogenetic system to control signaling nodes with the high resolution in both space and time. He earned his PhD with the Dave uh, Seifer at UC Berkeley, where he developed the first method to control protein aggregation with light, which he leveraged to enable for a control of multiple mammalian signaling pathways, including receptor tyrosine kinases. As a postdoc with Wendell Lim at UCSF, he applied optogenetic control of loss signaling to show that certain oncogen can alter signal transmission kinetics in cancer cells and that these, I mean, altered kinetics can cause cell to uh, misperceive their environment and inappropriately enter the cell cycle. So what in his lab, you know, own lab now focus on how oncogenes and their response to therapy affect signal transmission in cancer cell and also the principle by which beta catenin regulate stem cell behaviors and morphogenesis in intestinal organoids. And that probably was another thing, I mean, uh, connected to me and to John, and also the development of novel reporters, optogenic tools, and now a thermal optogenic tool for on-demand remote control and observation of cell behaviors. His many awards include Arnold Beckman Postdoctoral Fellowship, and of course, NIH R35, the huge honor, and NSF career, to name just a few, and especially NSF career starts this year. So congrats, I'm so excited. I mean, Lucas, take it away. And thank you so much for your time and then sharing your vision and your research today. Great, thank you, Taesak, for the uh, excellent introduction. <laughs> and for the opportunity to uh, present our work. Uh, I'm gonna share the screen. Okay, is this uh, showing up? Great, okay. So yeah, so so thank you again for the opportunity to, to be here. This is really wonderful for all of us junior faculty and it's, it's a huge service that, that you've uh, done for the community. Um, what I'm gonna tell you about today is uh, a, a, along the lines of, of, of what was in the introduction um, and how we're, you know, I'm gonna tell you about how we're using uh, tools of synthetic biology to better understand uh, signal transmission in cells and how it can break down in, um, in diseases specifically in cancer. And this is the latest work from our lab. We just posted it on BioArchive, so um, I encourage you to go read it, but let me give you the, the highlights here. Um, and this work, before I start, I'll, I'll say that this was um, led by two uh, really excellent trainees in, in my lab. Uh, David Gonzalez Martinez is a, is a graduate student, and Lee Roth is a uh, postdoc. And, and before I get into the, 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 the main story, just let me give you a, a brief overview of, of, of what our lab does. Uh, like like Taysok said, we're interested in understanding principles of cell signaling, but we do this through a lens of precision molecular control. And uh, what this has meant to date mostly has been through developing and using light activatable optogenetic tools. And this goes back to, 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 to my graduate work that I did in David Schaefer's lab, where we developed the first methods to use light to, to aggregate proteins uh, in cells and, and use this aggregation to control, you know, many different things actually, but we focused on signaling pathways. And now in my own lab, we, we develop these sorts of tools, but then also now we've gotten into developing temperature sensitive tools or optical and temperature sensitive tools, which I won't talk about today, but this has also just recently been published and, and this opened a whole new area in our, in our lab. So we apply these and other tools <laughs> to then again, uh, understand how, how cell signaling works and how cells actually perceive signals. Uh, and then to the, to, uh, you know, a, an extension of that is to understand how this can break down in disease. And this is really where our, our story is gonna focus on today uh, is applying these methods to understand cancer and, and how, to, uh, how to treat it. 
And before I start, I'd like to really focus on a word that I said, you know, that I, I like to apply to cell signaling and that's um, uh, of perception, right? So what does it mean for a cell to perceive something? And I think a, a really useful analogy is to think about signaling networks like the brains of the cell, right? So like, uh, like you have light that hits your eye and your eye senses that light, but it doesn't mean anything until your brain perceives it, right? These complex networks of neurons interpret that stimulus and then you, you know, instruct you to do something in response. And it's the same story for the cell, which has you know, uh, receptors at the membrane that sense biochemical information, uh, but, but, that's, but that, that sensing event then has to be perceived by these networks of, of uh, signaling proteins that then instruct the cell what to do um, at, you know, at the appropriate place and time. And so if you, you know, uh, accept this analogy, then it's only one uh, step further to, to um, think that if cells can perceive, then perhaps they can also misperceive, okay? And is misperception of, of signals a, a useful way to, you know, understand things like disease, like especially specifically cancer? And so, I, you know, actually in my postdoc, this is, we, we pursued this hypothesis that perhaps actually we can, uh, that uh, we could find examples where in certain cancers, we could find that cells are actually misperceiving signals and that's either, you know, a, a consequence or actually a cause of disease. And we thought optogenetics would be a really great tool for this because, so optogenetics is light activatable uh, control of, uh, in our case, cell signals. And what this allows us to do is to, to provide really precise inputs and then measure outputs uh, uh, downstream in many different nodes, you know, maybe it's a downstream signaling node, maybe it's transcription or cell fate. Okay, and and what we what we did there, and this, this would work actually. I should mention that was in I, I was a postdoc with Wendell Lim. This was in collaboration also with uh, Trevor Bavoman and all, and also Jared Tocher. And what we what we did there was we applied optogenic control of the ras erg pathway. This is a pathway we'll talk about a lot in this talk, and it's central to, to growth and differentiation and sort of uh, many processes in, in cells and organisms, but also drives about half of human cancers, including the ones that, that we looked at. So we, we uh, provided precise stimuli of, of RAS signaling through this tool called Optosos. And again, we measured uh, uh, downstream effects. And uh, the long story short is what we found is a whole class of oncogenes that actually misinterpreted the uh, dynamic RAS signals, okay? So pulses of RAS here on the right uh, in a normal cell would then uh, at the level of ERK would be also uh, induce ERK pulses. But in the presence of this oncogene, actually those pulses uh, because of extended kinetics of pathway activation became interpreted like sustained signals. And so this, this the misinterpretation or misperception of dynamic inputs could actually bias cells to enter the cell cycle when they otherwise shouldn't have. I'm not going to mention any more about this work. Uh, it's all it's all published, but you know this was sort of the uh, uh, conceptual seed of things that we started doing in our own lab, uh, which we started about three years ago at um, at Penn. And we were curious to see, you know, what other kinds of misperception could we find, right? Uh, and and what, what what else is out there? And we quickly <laughs> gravitated towards a, a totally different type of cancer that was driven by this oncogene called EML4 ALK. And I'm going to. Uh, EML for ALK is a, one of a larger uh, set of oncogenes called RTK fusions or receptor tyrosine kinase fusions, which I'll introduce here for a second because they're, they're, many, they're not known to many people, but they're, they're fascinating. Um, <clears throat> unlike many oncogenes, they're not point mutants, but they're actually chimeric proteins that happen through chromosomal rearrangements. And uh, these oncogenes uh, basically fuse the endodomain of uh, a, a receptor fused and they it's fused to a, some kind of fusion partner from an unrelated protein and one of the the features of these partners is that they're often oligomeric and this is what allows activation of this kinase domain that then leads to this uh, oncogenic signal there are many of these there's over 50 that have been described really across cancer types and again the one that we're, we're, we focus on is called eml 4 alk i would say it's one of the better characterized ones uh, and a couple specifics about this particular oncogene, it's mostly found in lung cancer um, and it drives uh, oncogenic signaling through the same RAS or pathway that, uh, that we uh, ju uh, just discussed. And it actually, you know, it, it re represents somewhat of a clinical success story in terms of uh, targeted therapy. There, there are I know, three generations of specific uh, and potent ALK inhibitors that uh, elicit um, a good responses in patients, so, so, so uh, tumor remission, but Un, um, uh, like other targeted therapies, uh, ultimately drug resistance emerges, right? And so there's a huge problem facing all targeted therapies uh, and really highlights the, the need to better understand how oncogene cells and the drugs we use to treat them interact um, so that we can, uh, you know, uh, uh, counteract uh, resistance emergence. 
Another thing that's important to know about Emil Farrakh that you might have noticed uh, from this image here, uh, where, where it's labeled in green, is, is its expression pattern, right? So it's, even though it has a receptor fragment, it's not at the membrane like most receptors, it's actually in the cytoplasm. And it's in the cytoplasm as these um, aggregates or granules of, of, of oncogene. And this was described in a really beautiful paper this, this past year from the lab of, of Trevor Bavona. Um, and, and when we saw this, uh, we, you know, this, this uh, uh, you know, made us really interested because we thought, well, here is uh, an example uh, where uh, that has, you know, high potential for this exact type, type of, you know, a signal misperception due to uh, uh, the expression of an oncogene. And the reason is that because these cells now have multiple sources of receptor signals, right? So you have the standard uh, RTKs, these transmembrane receptors, but you also now have these cytoplasmic granules or condensates, as, as we'll all sort of refer to them uh, both ways, um, that are also signaling through the same pathways, through the same shared effectors, these, these, these down, immediately downstream adapters that then couple to you know, pathways like RAS-ERK. Uh, all these same downstream components, uh, well, they're the same between these, uh, the membrane receptors and the granules. And so we started with this very basic question of how do these uh, two different sources functionally interact, right? And, you know, they could be synergistic, maybe they're antagonistic, uh, we're not sure, but there's a high likelihood that there's some sort of functional connection. And um, beyond this sort of like basic cancer signaling biology curiosity, it's actually really important to understand these interactions because, because of this, uh, you know, uh, problem of resistance, uh, signaling through RDKs is a, is a very well-known, a uh, well-characterized method by which cells survive treatment and ultimately develop resistance. So again, we started with a very basic question, how uh, does the presence of this oncogene affect signal transmission through these standard routes of, of how cells sense and perceive their environment? And so we applied this, this, uh, this uh, approach, which we call functional profiling, where we apply specific inputs and we measure outputs at, at various different levels. And this is uh, you know, how we implemented this, right? So we took an optogenetic receptor, uh, in this case, a, an optogenetic FGFR, which we can activate with blue light using the same kind of blue light clustering that I mentioned to you in, in the first slide. And when we shine blue light, uh, we activate many pathways downstream, including ras erk signaling. Uh, and, and we assay ERK uh, through immunofluorescence for phospho ERK. And you're gonna see a lot of data in this, in this talk, a lot of it's immunofluorescence, and most of it is uh, summaries of single cell immunofluorescence of activated ERK, which indicates pathway activity. And so really the key result is here. Um, we put this opto FGFR into cancer cells and we, we turn the light on and we stain for phospho ERK. And, and this is the result. And what you actually see here is two, two curves, right? The light gray is the pre-stimulation and the dark gray is the post-stimulation. And the first thing you see is that they're basically the same curve, so, which means that, that when you add light, you really can't stimulate the pathway in these cells. Okay, which is interesting uh, on its in, by itself. <laughs> but what was more interesting was when we did the same experiment, uh, but in the presence of one of these ALK inhibitors. And there are a couple of things happen. First, uh, you drop the basal signal. This makes sense because the oncogene drives, you know, uh, higher levels of ERK activity. You inhibit the oncogene, you lose basal signal. But now when you add light, you can really crank signal through this pathway, right? You get like 20 to 30 fold expression. Uh, it, it's, it's dose dependent based on the um, intensity of light. So, uh, but the important thing is that the, the maximum amplitude that you can reach surpasses that what you get in the cancer cells, you know, with or without light activation. So that's, the, that's saying that up here, we're not saturating the signal. The, the cells are actually not responding to, to receptor uh, uh, tyrosine kinases even when we turn them on, right? And we can, we can uh, paradoxically increase that signal uh, induction with adding an, uh, this oncogene inhibitor. And as I mentioned, this is a dose dependent effect. So if we tune the light intensity, we can, we can achieve really high levels at higher light intensities in the presence of drug. But in the absence of drug, uh, we, again, we see effectively no response. So this was interesting, and, and we, we wanted to follow it up by then seeing, you know, does this also happen when we add ligands of the uh, endogenous receptors, or is this just some kind of weird optogenetic, you know, artifact? And so what we did was we added um, growth factor, EGF. These cells have a lot of EGF receptor, and we basically get the same result. This is two cancer cell lines now um, that we'll see a lot in this talk, um, and they behave the same way. This is a, a same experiment, but now a time course. So we add EGF and we look at the, the phospho ERK um, over time. And you can see here again, without drug, you get maybe like a one and a half fold response, uh, quite small. But when you add drug, um, now you have a, a, a much larger increase, both in terms of you know, maximal signal that you can reach, but also in terms of fold change. And this dynamic range or, or fold change is, is, is again, dose dependent based on the, um, the amount of EGF that you give. 
Okay, so it looks like we have this uh, suppressive interaction then between uh, the, the oncogene and these receptors, okay? Um, but of course, so there's a lot of things happening in cancer cells, so we wanted to really make sure this was due to the oncogene. So we went to a isogenic cell line, basically a, a, a lung epithelial cell line, where we took a, where we overexpressed the oncogene, and then we saw, uh, we did the same experiment. We added EGF and, and, and looked at the response. And again, we get the same thing. So uh, here in gray is the wild type cell. You get a strong, uh, response to EGF. Now in the red is cells that we've transfected with eml 4 l You see a high basal level of signal, but then we, when you add EGF, you get a, a very small increase. And now when you add ALK inhibitor, you can restore this really large dynamic range of signaling uh, that you had in the absence of drug. Confirming that, the, that the, you know, basically that the presence of this oncogene really provides a suppressive effect on uh, transmembrane receptors. So th this is, you know, again, very intriguing, and, and we wanted to first figure out what, what is happening, what is, what is mediating the suppressive effect, and there are any number of mechanisms that could be doing this, and so we wanted to narrow them down. First, we wanted to look at the timescales at which this relief of suppression happens, okay, and so <laughs> again, this is in an experiment I'll go over briefly. This is in both cell lines. We can just look at one of these plots. It's the same result. Uh, we can see the, un the open circles are unstimulated cells. The um, the, 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 the solid circles are EGF stimulated cells. And then the, um, the, the x-axis is uh, pre-incubation of drug. So how long have we added drug before we stimulate? And you can see that really just within minutes of adding drug, you get this potentiation of signal, right? Uh, with the, it rises with a, with a half time uh, of like about 15 minutes, right? And it maxes out about one hour. So what this is saying that th this drug effect that we're seeing where we can potentiate signaling through the, the, the receptor uh, happens really fast. And so this is most likely a post-translational mechanism. Okay, so we've sort of narrowed down the potential uh, uh, causes of what we're seeing. So we can further narrow it down by using some optogenetic tricks. And in this case, uh, you know, we, we have, we, all we know is that eml frog interacts with some node here, uh, and we don't know which one. Some node in the pathway that gives a suppressive effect. And so we can actually use optogenetics to sort of walk down the pathway and stimulate a different nodes and see, do we still see the same effect, okay? And once we stop seeing the effect, we know, okay, we've gone too far, that effect is mediated, you know, uh, at, at some point upstream. And so we had two, two tools that we used. One was this OptoFGFR that I've already introduced. The other one's OptoSAS, which I actually also introduced in, from prior work, but it's basically light activation of, of RAS, endogenous RAS signals. So with OptoFGFR, this is a different way of looking at the same experiment. Here again, uh, stimulation uh, it goes from the, the, the open circles to solid circles. Without drug, we have very low stimulation. With drug, we have very high stimulation, right? And we can, and again, uh, achieve stronger than, uh, than in the absence of drug. This is this relief of suppression. But when we do the same experiment with OptoSAS, one step or a couple steps downstream, uh, we see no such relief of suppression, right? With and without drug, we get the same uh, maximum amplitude of signal activation. So this, this suggested to us that, uh, you know, the where this like molecular interaction is happening is actually right here, uh, somewhere between receptor activation and um, activation of RAS, upstream of RAS activation, um, uh, you know, it's somewhere in the space. And what I'm not showing you here, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I didn't include this data, but actually uh, what another piece of data we have is that actually it's not happening at the receptor level, meaning receptor phosphorylation is happening. Uh, but that phosphorylation is not being perceived, is not being transduced by the cell. So, uh, okay, so, so, so let's dig further. And, and we looked into the literature to see, is there any precedent for some oncogene to actually suppress signal transmission through its own receptor? I got disconnected. Should I just, uh, what was the last, let me just start up and see if. Yeah, you just, you was just have out uh, just 20 seconds. 20 seconds, okay. Have we gotten to this slide yet? Uh, you can, you know, repeat this one. Sure, maybe. sure. So the, the point, <coughs> thank you. The point is that we, um, we wanted to look for uh, other examples where, um, where, uh, uh, you know, 
what are there other examples where an oncogene can, can suppress its own receptors? And there is one very prominent one in, in BRAF V600E cancers like melanoma, like in melanoma. And, and, and in this cancer, um, RAF is mutated. So it's constitutively active. It activates MEK and ERK and drives cancer downstream. But it also uh, has a lot of ERK dependent feedback. So this is either through transcriptional uh, upregulation of, 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 um, of, of negative regulators or through phosphorylation of adapters. Uh, but through 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 a lot of different mechanisms, there's actually can, it can suppress its own you know um, transmission through RTKs, and so this was an obvious place to to look like is this actually uh, playing a role in our system? Uh, but the the challenge was one challenge was that that you know there's a lot of potential mechanisms, so that's you know many different assays to look at a lot of to kind of knock down all of these potential options. But one of the really wonderful things about optogenetics is it let it let us test this hypothesis in um, a very, very efficient way. And, and that is by using uh, um, uh, optogenetic RAS signaling in, in the following way. So again, here we have our, our, our schematic of what might be happening, right? emo 4 alk activates this pathway. There could be some potential negative feedback either from just the emo 4 alk or from this ERK dependent feedback. We wanna figure out which one. The problem is when we add alk inhibitor, we block everything, right? All of these potential arrows are, are gone. And so it's hard to figure out what's doing what. But what we can do is we can add ALK inhibitor and at the same time stimulate with light that activates RAS, okay? And in this way, we've, we've decoupled ALK activity from ras erc activation. And so it, with this experiment, we maintain high levels of ERK signal. We maintain any potential ERK negative feedback on the receptor. And thus we can see, and then we can see, do we still see our phenotype, okay? And if we do still see our phenotype, that means that it, uh, um, ERK probably wasn't so important, right? So let me let me uh, show you the results. So this is again same experiments of what I've shown you. Um, uh, without uh, without drug, EGF gives you a little bit of a signal response. With drug, EGF gives you a much larger signal response. <laughs> and now, if you do the experiment with drug and with light to maintain this 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 arrow from ERK to to um, receptors, you still get a really strong response. That means that this arrow uh, or this uh, inhibitory interaction is playing you know, little to no role in what we're seeing because we can maintain that and still we get this really strong response. Okay, so that basically ruled out a, uh, like a whole class of known mechanisms that could have explained this result. So if it's not those, then what is it? Okay, and this, this is the picture I painted sort of before where we weren't sure what this interaction could be. Well, <laughs> now we know that this is actually antagonistic. And so the question is how, and this is where we started thinking about, well, how does condensation or aggregation of this, this uh, oncogene, uh, maybe it plays a role. And because of all of these shared effectors, we thought, well, maybe, you know, there's a lot of uh, examples where multivalent uh, uh, proteins uh, or, or systems can actually act as sinks and sequester um, uh, proteins, right? And in this case, because of the, all these shared adapters, maybe this it's acting as a sink for these adapters that are required for receptor signaling. And because of this, uh, you know, we'd be getting strong oncogenic signaling, but almost no signaling from receptors. And we did a series of experiments to test this. Uh, first, um, we looked at a lot of mutants. So this is what eml 4 alk looks like, uh, the various domains. And there's a trimerization domain that, uh, that gives some oligomerization. There's the, the kinase domain. There's uh, uh, another domain called the help domain. And all these domains help the proteins cluster. And in this original work from, from the Bavona lab, what was shown was that um, actually if you mutate any number of these or any, any one of these domains, uh, this is the original, uh, the, the wild type protein. If you uh, eliminate kinase activity or this trimerization domain, those, um, uh, you no longer see these large condensates or granules. So we wanted to see, okay, if we express these proteins in cells with these mutants, do we still see the signal suppression? So this is uh, cells, um, these uh, uh, cell lines that we transfected with eml 4 alk And here you see the suppressive effect, right? Wild type cells with EGF, you get a big response. Uh, and the, um, when you, but when you transfect them with, with the oncogene, you get a, a suppressed response, okay? And now if you do the same experiment, but with, uh, but with the mutants that don't form aggregates, you no longer see that suppression, okay? So this uh, uh, one line of evidence showing that this, this aggregation is actually quite, um, quite important for the suppressive phenotype. But I think what, what, what maybe is, is, is more convincing is actually just like watching this suppression in action. So the, to do this, we looked at uh, um, uh, cells that had one of these adapters called GRAB2 fluorescently tagged so that we can watch it and how it translocates in the presence or absence of drug. 
And this is this is uh, that. Video. By the way, these cells were made uh, generated in, in Bo Huang's lab. In their lab has been very helpful uh, to us as, as we did these experiments. So we we um, these are cells that have this tagged adapter, and there's a, a lot going on here. So in some of these cells, some of these cells have been transfected with email 4 off. These are easy to find because they have these large aggregates. Uh, you're looking at Grab2, yeah, uh, but but the Grab2 localizes to EML for ALK, okay, in, 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 in this very clear pattern. But some of the cells, <coughs> excuse me, some of the cells don't have EML for ALK, and here the Grab2 is uh, diffuse, okay? So we can see both in the, in the same frame. And what's going to happen when I press play is we're going to add EGF and we're going to see how the Grab2 translocates. And if this is on loop for clarity, what you can see is that where you don't have EML for ALK, you see really nice membrane translocation within minutes. <laughs> and this is, you know, the adapter translocating to activated receptors. But the, but it's totally different in cells that have emo 4 alk right? The grab 2 stays in these condensates. It's just locked in there. And you see little to no translocation um, to the membrane. So this is really the, the first evidence that uh, this, this, this hypothesis might actually be true, that these condensates may be acting as sinks for, for these adapters. So the next question is then, what happens when you add drug? And... Um, our hypothesis would predict that the adapters drug would actually make the adapters do something else. They might, you know, come off of these condensates, and that's what we image here. We have uh, grab to again in these aggregates, and we, when I press when I press play, we're going to add drug these alk inhibitors, and what you can see is that uh, uh, actually quite rapidly the 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 grab to puncta dissolve right to, to a more diffuse um, uh, uh, localization. And we can quantify these clusters, and you can see that uh, this, the, um, this uh, you know, diffusion or, or disaggregation of GRAB2 happens quite rapidly, again, on about a 15-minute timescale. And this is, if you recall, this matches very closely the timescale with which we see this sort of signal potentiation um, to EGF um, in response to the drug. And then finally, we can put it all together uh, by saying, can we add ALK inhibitor and then add EGF? And then do we restore translocation? And this is exactly what happens. Here you see email, uh, aggregates of GRAB2 that uh, with the drug uh, become more diffuse. And now in that same cell, uh, EGF gives you really nice membrane translocation where it wouldn't have otherwise. So, so these and other data um, really are, are painting this, this clear picture. I'll mention one other piece. This is in cell lines, but on, like, we want to know what's happening in the cancer cells. Uh, and so what we did is we looked you know, directly through co-immuno precipitation uh, of another adapter called SOS1. This one binds GRAB2, so it's, it's very closely related. And we precipitated uh, the, the, the receptor, EGFR, and we looked for when does the adapter go to that receptor. And we found that it only precipitates when you have both drug and EGF, right? Just EGF doesn't do it, just drug doesn't do it. You have to have both EGF and drug, and only then will that adapter um, uh, associate with the receptor. So again, this is painting this clear picture where, where, where these condensates of oncogene are acting like sort of like a molecular sponge for these uh, adapters that are, that are required for RTK signals, uh, and that, that, that yields weak signaling, um, uh, weak response to EGF. But when you add drug, these targeted therapies uh, for the oncogene, you now you, you do block the oncogene, but now you redistribute these adapters that allow you to have really strong signal. <coughs> <Excuse me. clears throat> so we were really pleased to, to work this out, this mechanism. But the big question we still had was, does it actually matter, right? It's interesting, but like, does it actually have some consequence for drug response? And what I want to use the rest of the talk to convince you of is that, in fact, uh, uh, we think it does. And the way that we, we went about uh, asking this question was just looking at signaling happening in cells, okay? And so uh, what we, we use the a reporter of, of pathway activity. This is the ERK KTR reporter. Uh, the way this works is that uh, with ERK activity, uh, the reporter goes to the cytoplasm. And if ERK is off, it goes to the nucleus, okay? So it's, it shuttles between different cell compartments based on its activity. And uh, what you can see here is a video of untreated cancer cells. You can see that the reporter is sort of both in the nucleus and the cytoplasm. This indicates uh, intermediate activity, okay? And also it's static, meaning it's not really changing. And this is because of the tonic nature of signaling from the oncogene, okay? But this, the, the situation changes when we add ALK inhibitor, and that's here. So the first thing you'll notice when I press play, we add ALK inhibitor on the right, and uh, you see this, um, uh, a stronger accumulation of reporter in the nucleus, meaning that the pathway is off because the oncogene is off. But then what you see, hopefully you can see this because in Zoom, the videos are a little sometimes tough, but you can see these pulses or these waves of nuclear exclusion, which means pathway activity happening, you know, 
starting about an hour after drug treatment and then sort of throughout um, the whole uh, treatment time course. I'm going to replay this just in case um, it's, uh, it's not, it's, uh, it's hard to see. And then I could even stop it. Yeah, here, like here, you see, oh. yeah, here, you see uh, the fluorescence is leaving the nucleus because, um, because pathway is, is activated. Another thing you'll see is not just you see these pulses of activity, but you also see these like puncta forming. These are actually dead cells. So you see cells dying, which makes sense because we're adding oncogene and hitting cells. Um, but you see cells dying and cells pulsing. Okay, and we'll come back to that. But we can quantify this. Uh, basically, these are just heat maps of, of ERK activity. Uh, and you can see the sort of salt and pepper, um, uh, uh, you know, pulses. These are about 20 minute pulses. And this is like a, you know, 15 hour uh, a trace, but you don't really see them. Uh, you really don't see them at all in in the DMS. So in in, in the untreated uh, situation, okay. And you, of course, we can quantify how many pulses per cell, and so on. so most cells are actually in the course of our experiment pulsed. Now I mentioned that we have dying cells and signaling cells, and these are actually turns out very closely related. I've switched the, 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 the videos now. So on the left we have the drug treated cell, and I've, it's the same video we saw, but I've zoomed in and slowed it down. And so what you can see is that you'll see everywhere you see a pulsing cell, you see a dying cell nearby. Okay, we have a couple a couple examples of that here, uh, but again, pulsing, and then cell death right next to it. Okay, this is actually when you it's actually being quite obvious once we we, we start at these videos a little bit longer. And interestingly, uh, the um, this doesn't happen in the absence of drug. So these are control cells. You also see some cell death. Uh, but interestingly, the neighbors uh, in those of those dying cells uh, didn't show these same pulses that we saw with drug treatment. So uh, there's been a lot of interesting work in, on, on how in epithelial cells, um, uh, when a cell dies, it actually spits out ligands, EGF ligands, to, um, to its neighboring cells. And this actually helps the cells, its neighbors, survive, right? This is involved in uh, sort of protecting the uh, integrity of epithelial sheets. And so uh, we thought this was, you know, what was happening here, actually these dying cancer cells might be, you know, spitting out these, these ligands to their neighbors. Uh, and luckily there's a great way to test this. There are these ligands, you know, you can inhibit this, this paracrine signaling uh, with either inhibitors of the receptor, so EGFR inhibitors, or actually have matrix metalloproteases. This is a little less obvious, but this, uh, sh this sending of signals from, from uh, cell to cell requires uh, proteolytic cleavage through certain MMPs. And so inhibiting those can actually stop the sending uh, and, and stop this, um, uh, presumably stop these pulses. And, and just, in, you know, this is exactly what we see. When we do co-treatments with alkyl inhibitor and either of uh, an in, in inhibition of one of these two targets, we see a dramatic loss of, um, of this pulsing that, that I just showed you. And I can tell you this, you know, we can, quanti we can quantify this, this, this carefully. For every single death event, we can identify the neighbors of that death event and then, or the, the sort of the, um, the random uh, uh, non-neighbors non of that event. And we can count the pulses that happen um, uh, in those two populations. And so again, without treatment, you don't see any pulsing. Uh, with treatment, you see a lot of pulsing, but actually all of it is in these neighborhoods uh, uh, near uh, dying cells. And then if you do these co-treatments, you really uh, you know, effectively eliminate uh, this sort of neighbor pulsing, okay? So, so, uh, so you know, we're pretty confident in this mechanism. And it's just another thing I'm gonna point out is that again, without drug, you do have dying cells, but you don't have pulsing. And what that means is everything I told you in the first half of the talk about the sensitization of receptors uh, because of drug treatment uh, seems to be this really important first step to actually, uh, for this paracrine signaling to work, right? For the cells to actually perceive these ligands that their dying neighbors are, are sending out. So uh, finally, we wanted to see, okay, so we see these, the signaling, does it have an effect? These, we, we, I mentioned these can be survival signals. Are they actually providing survival signals to dying cancer, to uh, uh, drug-treated cancer cells? And we find that in fact they are, right? So we even, we look at uh, one day of drug treatment, just ALK inhibition alone gives you about 25% of cell death. But now either of these co-therapies gives you, you know, a dramatically uh, faster rate of cell killing, even just in the first day, okay? and so. Uh, if you then look out at um, you know a much longer response, so now at about three weeks, we see that th these these um, enhanced responses are actually maintained, right? So it's promoting durable responses to alk inhibition. Here you see uh, actually uh, the the purely the just alk inhibited cells actually start uh, um, uh, regrowing, right? So um, uh, this is sort of the first steps of resistance. This is drug talk.
well, I was pretty much done. So <laughs> let me just let me just finish. But um, you know, maybe a good time for a summary. Uh, basically, what 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 we've shown in this work is that we found that a certain oncogene, um, uh, these EMO uh, that that forms these condensates EMO four alk actually desensitizes uh, the function of uh, transmembrane receptors through this uh, adapter sequestration mechanism. <laughs> which means, uh, which uh, results in when you block the oncogene with these targeted therapies, although you block the oncogene, you also redistribute adapters. And the result of this is that you've now hypersensitized RTKs. And it turns out that this can actually be really important in therapy because of this effect where dying cells try to keep their neighbors alive. Uh, the cells are now very sensitive to those signals. And if you block those signals, you can actually speed killing of cancer cells um, uh, to your targeted therapy that, uh, that uh, is, 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 um, results in a more durable responses in, in terms of cancer killing. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there and you're really excited to, to hear any questions or feedback, but uh, for now, I'll just thank everyone that uh, made this happen. And, you know, I, I mentioned uh, David uh, and Lee uh, did uh, all of the work that, that you saw here today, and we had really great collaborations with uh, 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 Trevor Bavona's lab and also Bo Huang's lab, um, and also, of course, the, the funding sources that, uh, that also made this happen. Okay, so fantastic talk. I, I, I love it. Uh, also, I would say, you know, when in Beam trained his advisee, uh, including you, very well. And actually, I could not join his lab because he has a very high standard. And I joined <laughs> instead his neighbor at that time, Chris Foy. And he also has a very high standard, but at that sure. time, he was young. <laughs> uh, when I joined, so so he needs. I mean, anyone great or average, I would say. And also, <laughs> I believe you know how I want want you to enjoy the island rather than walk in your hotel room. I guess by temporarily disconnecting you uh, twice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so so I saw one question, uh, and then I you know ask you know John has any question or I'll ask my question. So. One person, you know, uh, you know, ask without telling uh, his or her name. Uh, this target mediated uh, cancer, or probably medi mediated and cancer cell inhibition method. How effective uh, does it get uh, when compared with the immunotherapy, chemo or surgery? And also, are there any side effect to this inhibition method. Yeah, I, I, I'm afraid I'm, uh, I'm uh, less um, qualified to answer this particular clinical question. I, this would probably be better directed to our uh, collaborators, particularly uh, Trevor Bavona. But in uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's always side effects to uh, to these therapies, right? And and their success in clinical trials uh, largely depends on right. We can we can we can show really good molecular effects, but effectively uh, they're they're commonly limited by what the maximum tolerated dose is uh, in patients. And in fact, um, so, so that, that's always a concern. Uh, again, I, I'm not the expert, so I, I don't wanna say one way or the other, but uh, you know, one of, the, one of the, uh, the results of our work was, uh, and you know, we're not the first to show that there's, a, that there's a, a, a synergy between if you block ALK inhibitor and EGF uh, receptor inhibitor, that, that, that's been known for, for several years now. That's actually also been in the clinic um, recently within the past couple of years. Uh, and again, be, although they had these great responses in, in, in addition, it was actually, um, it wasn't tolerated very well in patients, so it, so it never actually uh, succeeded as, as a therapy. So that, that, that speaks to right how, how you know, we we're showing sort of the first stages of, of potential therapies, but there's a, a long way to go still. Uh, but the, one of the, the cool things about the, the work that the sort of the chasing down this mechanism is I think it also provides potential other targets, right? Because uh, one, if, if um, you know, this paracrine signaling, uh, which in a cancer can come from, I guess now other cancer cells, but also immune cells or stromal cells, right? Uh, there are, uh, if that's a predominant uh, effect of what EGFR inhibitor is providing, there are many other ways now that you could put, think about targeting, maybe intracellularly at some of these adapters, or maybe with matrix metalloproteases. There's a lot now to look into uh, to see what other, what else beyond uh, uh, the receptor, you know, uh, EGFR inhibitors might work as, um, uh, as a synergistic therapy with these, with these potent ALK inhibitors. Okay, so any other question uh, or John, do you have any comment or question? You can speak. No, yeah, I, I Luca, uh, Lucas, I thought that was excellent. Um, 
two questions really. One, <clears throat> you showed potentiation, the ALK inhibitor uh, with, um, I mean, there's, there's with the MMP inhibitor and, and the, the third one, what was that? I forget the third one, but uh, you've shown dual potentiation. Have you tried all three? Um, we, we've not actually, no. Um, we have it. And actually, you know, the, the EGFR inhibitor is really good. Like if you, if you saw that, that, that tolerance, um, there's basically it, like, it just wipes out all cells. So I, I don't imagine that we would get better response if we added uh, the, the third ones. Um, but uh, we do want to do a lot more uh, in terms of, you know, the, the MMP inhibitor we use is, is a quite broad spectrum one. Um, and uh, so we do want to sort of do look at a lot more of these drugs to figure out exactly, um, you know, the, uh, you know, maybe more, do more specific ones work that'll help us figure out some mechanisms there. Um, and also like we've only tried one ALK inhibitor. So, and that's not true. We've tried a couple. So it is, it should be general to, to uh, uh, several, uh, all these different ALK inhibitors that, that exist. We just haven't tried them all. Um, but uh, we do want to get more into that space. Um, but, but yeah, we just, it's just, it's still early days. So another question. So many of these growth factors will bind uh, selectively to heparin sulfates on the cell surface, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we know that various heparin analogs, for example, have anti-cancer activity. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there is a tie-in to some of the signaling that you're looking at and how, you know, modifications even on the cancer cells, modifications in the heparin sulfate that affect the ability of uh, uh, both enhance the, uh, you know, the tumor genesis uh, or potentially are impacting the ability of various molecules to even effectively treat. The, That's fascinating. I actually, I'm not familiar with the, the heparin work on, on anti-cancer activity, but is this, is this happening through like uh, basically like sequestration of, of ligands? Is that, is that what, is, it, is the mechanism known? Well, I mean, I think it's all secondary because obviously people don't use can uh, heparin for uh, cancer. It's just known yeah. that it has that capability. Uh, yeah. It's probably through a uh, some sort of sequestration. It's some sort of decoy because what yeah. happens with heparin is that it will bind whatever heparin sulfate binds, potentially even more tightly because it's mm. even more highly sulfated. Mm. Uh, and as a result, it, it simply pulls away compounds, uh, growth factors, for example, that will bind to the heparin sulfate on the cell. That's so that's one simplistic example, uh, you know, argument. I'm sure there's something much more complex. <laughs> uh, so, you know, and we, we also know that heparin uh, will uh, act to, and heparin sulfates act to uh, inhibit some of the MMPs. Uh, so there are a number, and, and of course, Interestingly enough, I think uh, some of the cancer cells excrete uh, various uh, heparinases and, and that causes it. So it's all part of the same broad uh, mechanism uh, that is very complex, poorly understood. Yeah. And I think you're kind of touching on some of the fringes <laughs> of that right now that I think will be very interesting. It is interesting. It's fascinating. It's actually really exciting. I mean, I think that what, what uh, uh, it's just so clear that, you know, what, what basically what we're trying to think of, yeah, how do we block, you know, this, this, is, uh, this effect? Um, and that's, you need, you want something that is very generalizable, not just to one specific ligand, because there's a lot of these ligands and a lot of receptors that can have the same effect. That's really interesting. I, I'll, we'll have to think about that. Um, it'd be really, it sounds like a pretty easy thing to test as well. Um, at least in a dish, um, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but it, it, it sounds like it, it, in a class, like it's in a class of these things that would uh, be super effective. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah thanks for bringing that up. I haven't thought about that. Yeah. To, we can uh, talk offline about something. Yeah. 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 That's great. That's wonderful. That's all I want to do. Connecting, you know, young people with the big guys. Uh, <laughs> so wonderful. So any other question? Let me check the Q and A. You know, we answered the question. Uh, no chat. Actually, I have a question, but I will do you know after you know this main session. Uh, actually, I'm now start to worry about my connection because I plan to have a seminar trip to Europe later this year, and the internet connection would not be any better than in Hawaii, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, uh, if you do not have any further question, I want to close.
So thank all for joining and staying today, uh, even though very short notice about the Zoom link. I mean, just, I think, I mean, I posted, you know, sent that one two days ago. Uh, so we will meet again next week on February 24, Thursday, the same time, the same Zoom link. And we'll have the Dr. Dave Lokoglyph, uh, the NSF MCB program director. I'm not sure you know your program director is he or you know, somebody else. No, no. no, okay. no, no. Yeah. So and then also cross the leader in systems and synthetic biology. So one of the most important NSF director because he basically deal with all the synthetic biology uh, mm -hmm. proposals. And also we will have the Dr. Christian Cuba Samani Ego from UCLA. And as usual, the follow up informal chat will occur without recording. And so please stay here if you are interested in chatting with today's speakers. And I'll promote you to panelist level who can uh, speak and show your handsome or pretty face. So thank you so much for everyone. I will stop recording now. Okay.